Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Marketing Your Practice podcast, the podcast where I get to simplify marketing and mindset so I can help you, chiropractors, increase your income, your impact, your enjoyment in practice. I'm joined today by a friend of mine and physiotherapist, Paul Wright. Paul is the author of a best-selling book called The One Minute Practice. He's all about helping allied health practitioners have more freedom, uh, increase the time that they get to spend doing the things that they want to do. Today's chat was really focused all in around um, how do we get more of the wants in our lives and less the needs. Paul introduced the concept of how many hours do you need to be in practice? And I think that the ideal scenario would be that you need to be in practice zero hours per week, but perhaps you want to be in there 40 hours, which means you've got systems set up and other staff and your life set up in a way that the practice can run itself. Paul has helped hundreds, in fact, thousands of practices do this around the globe. He's working with chiropractors, naturopaths, osteopaths, physiotherapists, you name it from there as well. Paul talks about the problem that comes from our over-reliance on staff and why when we fall in love, you know, one of the great things about chiropractors is that we love what we do, but there are some challenges that come when we fall in love with chiropractic and our business model as well. And Paul also shares about how really great systems can make ordinary or good people into great people as well. I love this conversation. I think it is one of the more important conversations that I've had here on the Marketing Your Practice podcast. Let's jump in and talk with Paul Wright. Welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast, where we guide natural health and wellness experts through the pitfalls of marketing. Each episode, you'll learn simple, effective, easily actionable, and heart-centered marketing strategies. And here's your host, Angus Pike. Paul Wright, welcome to the Marketing Your Practice podcast. How are you, my friend? Mate, I'm so happy to be here. I've hit you up for so many things over the years, and finally uh, the tables are turned. So we'll see how this goes. It, um, I, I'm excited to... Uh, I, I, I'm trying to think about how we've known each other for five or six years now. I think we first came across each other. We share a lot of similar philosophies. There's often... Here in Australia, there's often real separate silos between chiropractors and physiotherapists. I don't know why. It, it, I think it's mad. I think we have more in common than we have in, in, in different as well. You're getting less though. We're noticing that. Um, we've got chiro, physio, podiatry clients there. The, the lines are getting more and more blurred all the time between each of them. So I think there's less barrier than there used to be. We're all in the same boat. I think it's interesting because I, I, I've no more reason to have any sense of competition with a physiotherapist than I do a dentist you know so it's like you deal with the teeth we have very different expertises but perhaps we'll talk about that kind of stuff there too I, I've loved your approach we're going to talk about this concept today which I want to dive into the one minute practice we'll talk about that a little but why don't perhaps for our listeners that haven't had the five-year relationship that we've had why don't you give them a bit of your background journey as a health business owner and perhaps what's led you to now really as a coach a speaker um, as well um, I suppose, I, well, I, I was a small country town boy, Angus. I grew up in a place called Canamble, about 100 miles north of Dubbo in Ooh. western New South Wales. So, right. and there, there wasn't, there was no physios, chiros, osteos in, in Canamble. Mm. So, so what does a young bloke do that likes a bit of sport? He, he becomes a PE teacher. So that's, because that's the only thing I knew. I, I'll, I know sport, so I'll be, I'll do that. Mm. So I, so I, I get accepted to Newcastle Uni, become a, trained to be a physio. In my third year of, uh, sorry, trying to be a physical education teacher. In my third year of phys ed teaching, I, I met a, a physio, mm. but I didn't know what a physio was. I just, I, I liked anatomy and physiology. So I got interested in it. And then I found this, this pathway called physio. So it matches up with my sport, interest, exercise, applied to Sydney Union and heaven help me, I got accepted as a mature age student. And you know, you have those crossroads, Angus. I remember getting the letter. I got the letter from Sydney Uni. In those days, Cumberland College. And do I take it? Like, do I go to Sydney Uni, another four years of uni? You know, and I think my entrepreneurial streak was already there. And I knew I couldn't work for myself really as a PE teacher. So I think I'm a chance of being my own business owner as a physio. So then I went and accepted the position. Hardest four years of my life, Angus. So I'm telling you, gee, I, I just worked hard because I wasn't a natural student. And these kids are all smart. And I was a phys ed teacher from the bush. And I remember the first day on campus at Cumberland College, 
you know, and I'd come from the phys ed school at Newcastle College, which was just a riot. Like we, there was a toga party every night and it was just a riot. Mm. And we did some days, Angus, where, where the morning class was cricket and the afternoon was tennis. And that was our course. Yeah. So I go to, to Cumberland College and the library was full on the first day and it was just bum down and go for it. So I, I got through the course, um, very quickly realised I couldn't really work for someone else. So I did a year in the public hospital as a physio, but then I opened my own practice. And over the next 15 years or so, I built six practices and then I sold them. And there's a lesson there already for you guys. Um, the, the only role of your business is to sell it. Um, whether you choose to sell or not, it's a different thing. But I sold my practices, exited, and went down this pathway of mentoring and helping other owners uh, to grow their businesses uh, the same way I did. Because I, I had six of them, Angus, but I wasn't going to any of them. Right. I was, I was very much a remote owner. I lived in Newcastle at that stage, and five of them were in Sydney, which is an hour and a half away. So, um, you know, I was fortunate. I think my, my lucky break, though, Angus, was my interest in or my links to the fitness industry because I was heavily involved in technology, technical education for personal trainers in the Australian fitness industry. And they always had a really good business strand at their conferences. Mm. Yeah. You know, personal trainers, the gyms, they sell, like they, they, they eat what they kill in the fitness industry. Yes. So that helped me because I went to every business strand. I, I became business educated on the back of the fitness industry conferences then realised, gee, there's nothing like this for physios, chiros, osteos, podiatrists. This is 10 years ago. Mm. So that kind of led me down the path of helping other business owners do what I did. And that's kind of where this creation of programs, mentoring, products, one-minute practice, that's kind of where it all came from. And you know, that's that's it in a nutshell. And that's where I end up where I am today with my beautiful wife, Helen, and my four daughters who keep me busy. <laughs> Let's explore this idea that the only reason that you would open a practice, a business, is so that you could sell it. I hear other things that the only purpose of a business is to create a customer. The only purpose of a business is to turn a profit. And yet, when most of us, and when I say us, you know, our listeners, allied health chiropractors, when we start up our practice, that for the vast majority, that's the furthest thing from our mind. We get into it because we want to help people. There was some kind of dream early on of, oh, I like the idea of helping people. Maybe some people had the foresight that you did that was, oh, yeah, I'd like to work for myself also. That kind of has its thoughts. Where does that fit in? Because it, so many of these hands-on practitioners, a big heart. It's like, no, 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 no. It's not about making a profit. It's about helping sick people get well. Um, you know, I want to make a difference to my community, all those kind of things. Where do, you, where do you fit that in with the idea of the only reason to start a practice is to sell it? Well, I, I started out with that. I didn't really, maybe I, looking back, I did like physio and injury. So I ended up that pathway, but I, but I think I realized I wasn't a great employee. Yeah. And I think so. I didn't like being told what to do. Uh, I saw a lot of things didn't make any sense when I looked. Now, so most, most entrepreneurs are chronically unemployable. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was chronically unemployable very early. So my only solution was to get it to open a business. But I did what most of you guys do. I, I was in my, my first practice, which I, in Chatswood in Sydney. So I'd, I'd get there, the sun, I'd have my cubicle, the sun would go up uh, as I watched, as I was in the treatment room with the window, the sun would go down, I'd still be there. Mm. That was, I, was, I did that for a while. And, I, and it was interesting, we talked about turning points a while ago. I'm on Eastern Valley Way, which is a major road going through Sydney. And, there's, and this bus kept going past. And I'm on, uh, treating my patients, looking out the window as the day went by. And on the side of the bus was the writing, why most small businesses fail and what to do about it. And, it, and this bus kept going past. Now, I'm, I'm better now than I was then. I'm better at, at you know, this is the old universe is telling me something. And, and, I, and it sent me this bus message hundreds of times. And finally, mm -hmm. I, I contacted the number and I ended up at a Michael Gerber seminar, uh -huh, which, yes. was, which was the classic e-myth. Yeah. And you've, hopefully you, all you guys have read the e-myth, but that's the entrepreneurial myth. And, I'm, and as I read the book... Well, give, give our audience a 30-second thumbnail of what the e-myth is. Well, the e-myth principle is essentially... We, one of the worst things we can do is, is go into business in something we can actually do ourselves. So it's, I, I, I opened a physio practice because I was a physio, so I could do the physio work. Mm. And the entrepreneurial myth is that I'm a business owner. 
So I own my physio practice. So that's the, and Gerber talks about the entrepreneurial seizure where he says, you've had this seizure and all of a sudden you go from working for someone as a therapist to wanting to own the business of doing that. What we don't understand is owning the business is, is a massive difference to being an employee in the business. So you then, you own the business and, and all of a sudden, as I was, I'm treating the patients, doing the books, doing the marketing, doing everything else, recruiting, all these things that I had no training in. So that, so the entrepreneurial myth is that you are an entrepreneur because you have your own business when you really don't. You're a business owner trapped inside a business that's killing you. Yes. And that's the, so, so but I embraced it. And so I got so into this e-myth and I had a mate who I was doing this with in the fitness industry. And we used to then, our challenge was who could drop their physical consulting hours the most? Who could do the less hands-on work? And I, I do it with my clients now. We talk about a thing called the freedom score. Mm. And the freedom score is essentially how many hours per week do you physically need to be at your practice seeing patients? And that's the freedom score. And I want to ask people about this they, they'll say 40 50 60 i've had one guy that did 80 hours clinical a week mm. so what's your freedom mm. score so the whole idea is to try and get your freedom score down to nothing that's my plan yes which then gives you freedom as i had to do what i want when i want yeah the biggest mistake though anger so the biggest problem we face and we've all done it we fall in love with our product mm. I, I fell in love with the idea of being a physio. You guys fell in love with being a, a chiropractor. We fall in love with the idea of being something. Yet when it when push comes to shove, and I learned this the hard way, the market doesn't care what you want to do. Your job is to fall in love with your market. Find, find the hungry market and provide the service for them, which is what I did. Like I, I went to physio school, and it's not even thinking, is there a market? Do they need more physios? Do they need more physio practices? Because I, I wanted to be a physio. I wanted to open a physio practice. But I didn't really look very hard as to whether there was a need for that or a want for that because I wanted to do it. Yeah. So my biggest challenge to you guys, what's the market want? Yes. And solve, solve that, then you'll be successful. Yeah, I want to I want to take a back step there too. I, I have lots of these conversations. I'm fascinated by them as well, and they're confronting for a lot of people. And you asked a question before: How many hours a week do you need to be in practice? Now, need is different from want because I, the ideal situation would be: is I need to be in there zero hours, but I want to be in there 40, 80, 60. Whatever you want is good. So don't think for one moment maybe you know that Paul is saying. Uh, you know, what your wants are. But it would be a great situation for you to be going to work because you want to as opposed to you need to. So I want to I just stop our listeners for a moment and just check in with that for a moment too because some of what we will talk about today, I know it did for me in the early days, Paul, it really challenged my identity of who I saw myself as and where did I fit into this whole thing. And I, I like you, was knew very early on I needed to be my own boss. And so I found out that when I started up my own practice, I was still an employee. I was my employee and I had all these extra things on top of it as well. And that's, you know, some of my understanding of Gerber's work too. And I'm sure you've studied a lot more deeper than I have. It's part of the myth is, is you think that in order for you to be good at business, all you need to be good at is helping your patients. And it's a small part of the puzzle and sadly for me, maybe even the smallest part, like I know so many chiropractors who are gifted at what they do, but are terrible with their businesses and so therefore get 20 years into practice and have nothing to show for it. And I know others that are not so great at what they do there too, but gifted business people and they get to the end and there's a lot left over there too. And the good news is, is it's not an either or, like be great at what you do and be a great business person as, as well. And sometimes I think we try and again, silo it. I'm either an entrepreneur or I'm not. It's like, just be both. Paul will teach us a little bit about how to do both of that as, as well. So tell me more about this concept of why it's such a challenge that we fall in love with our product. Where does that lead us to? Well, we spend years at university learning to do it. Yeah. Fundamentally, we, 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 it's so hard to get in. Uh, then when you get accepted and something that you want to do, and and that's and, and as you said a second ago, our identity is crafted by us being a physiotherapist or a chiropractor. We, that, that's our identity, and yep. you're the doctor. Yeah. 
and 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 then and I, I work with a lot of clients and it's a mindset Angus and so mm. it, it's the idea that you it's hard to get your head around but you you don't want to be the smartest therapist in your practice you, I, I was very very happy and on my definition of success in my practice was that my book was empty and everyone else's was full yes. that was my definition because yeah. what does that give me it gives me freedom yeah and now, I, I, now, when I say to my clients, um, we talk about freedom score. Yeah, I've got some that still do forty-hour week consulting, but but we know their numbers so well. We know their profit and loss. We know their analysis, and they they don't have to do that. They but they choose to do it, as you said, because they love it. Mm. But equally, what do you, what's the idea of being a business owner if you can't choose your own hours, if you can't take days off, if you can't take holidays? Like that's you might as well have a job, and then you stop all the other stuff. So it's, it's, I think it's the mindset, Angus, of what do you want your business to do for you? And my business, I, I had very clear directions. And once I, once I worked it out and once I got E-Myth in, in my head right, the job of my business was to give me more life. Yes. That's what its job was. Its job was to fund my lifestyle so I could do what I want, when I wanted with my, with my family. And I, I miss, and as a result of that, I miss nothing. I, but four girls, as, as I was at everything, I was at every, every sports carnival. I, the, one of my daughter's principals in primary school called, called me aside once and he said, Paul, are you a drug dealer? What do you do? Because I, I was at everything. Yes. But I, I, but I chose to be at everything, Angus. I, and I think one of, the, one of the things I live by, and this is, I'm not putting my morals on you guys, but this is just, just how I live my life. Never, never, ever, put a monetary value on your family time. Mm -hmm. Never put a monetary value on your family time. Yet I see us do it all the time in business because we say, well, if I cancel the afternoon's list to, to attend my daughter's school carnival or whatever it is, it's going to cost me two grand. Yeah. Or it's going to cost me a thousand dollars, which is just, it's ridiculous because you can't put a monetary value on that. It's just not right. And, and, and I say, I say to my lectures, Family time, this is one of my fundamental, I've got fundamental principles all over mm -hmm. the place, but my family time is quantity time. Yeah. People talk about have quality, quality time with the kids. I think that's rubbish. Quality time, no, you have quantity time because you never know when those special moments are going to happen. Mm -hmm. You can't plan it. I'm, I'm, I'm on the out, I'm on my deck at my, my home years ago when one of my, my second youngest daughter was still at home. She comes home. I'm just reading a book on the deck because that's what I was doing. I was you know, just there at home because that was what I was doing. She comes in. She stands at the doorway, and she's not a crier. She's a very, very stoic young lady. But she's got this world's tears in her eyes. And I said, "Yeah, okay, darling." And she just dissolves. You know, one of those moments where she just dissolves. And and, mm -hmm. and I can count on on one hand the number of times that's happened to her in her life. But she said that that. But at that moment, she needed her old man. Yes. And, and it, she didn't say anything. We just, I cuddled. She said, yeah, okay, Dylan. Yeah, I'm okay now, dad. And she took off. Yeah. Put, put a price on that. What's, what are you going to remember? You're going to remember the patient you saw or you're going to remember that cuddle. And here we are 15 years later, I'm still telling the story. What are you yeah. going to remember? But anyway, this is, but, that's, but that's my principles. The bottom line, you can choose to do what you want to do, but you should have the ability to choose if you... If the business is trapping you, if you're there because oh the patients need me, or or if they'll go somewhere else, or all these scarcity things, you're you're a slave to your business. Yeah, like, that's not that's not how that's not what I went in business for. I don't know about you guys. That's not what I went in business for. I, I'm I'm a big fan of choice. You know, it's 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 come up a couple of times here. We've talked about wants versus needs, and you know what is it that you want in there too? I also you know. I, I want to share also a flip side to conversations like that as well. And, you know, certainly in the initial five years of opening up my practice, Paul, I was there a lot. And when I opened up the practice, um, I had a six month pregnant wife and we had $2,000. Now, at that stage there, the best way I could serve my family and my pregnant wife, I decided, was be able to put a roof over her head and make sure that we had food each and every week. And that meant I worked a lot of hours to begin with. And I had a plan with that that I didn't want to do it. But because I'm the I guess what I want to check in, because I hear these things all the time, 
is that to get to the stage where you were sitting out in the balcony reading your book, smart planning, you know, we can speed this process up with coaches and those kind of things there too. But I do think, and this is, could be just a wrong belief system of mine, there's a time in the early days where there needs to be hustle. Like I can't, you know, that you need to know what you're doing. Some people are better than others there too. And I see this with some young practitioners that see where I am now after 25 years of practice and want to start there. I'm like, ah, ah, you don't, ah, this is not where it began. You know, in the early days, I did the time. Now, if I knew what I knew now, I could speed that process up. But I want to throw that cautionary tale out there that, you know, Paul went through different, I'm sure there were some 80 hour weeks in there. Was. Yeah, so we need to, I, I want to, because otherwise this is all the secret. We sit back and imagine our way into a practice where we're out in the balcony hugging our kids. I've got great relationship with my family because I've spent time with them. But in the early days, we have to kind of find our balance in there as well. Well, let me, let me tell you where it fails, where it falls down for owners. Mm -hmm. They, There are two fundamental drivers to every business, Angus. The, the fundamental drivers are available market mm -hmm. and available labour. So yeah, available nice. market and available labour. Explain those. Well, let's let's tell you who gets it wrong. Uh, the, the guy that comes to me once in a seminar, he said, Roddy, I, I want to open uh, six practices in the northern beaches of Sydney. That was his. I said, okay, fantastic. Uh, where are going to get the labour from? I'll just advertise. That, that, mm. Well, firstly... Is, the, is there market for another six practices in the northern beaches of Sydney? So is there enough people, firstly? And, and we're in the middle of a pretty big labour shortage here in, at the moment. So can you staff that? So there's a guy that's going to open six practices and have, and he'll be doing it himself because there's no available labour. Mm -hmm. So there's a guy that hasn't got those two fundamentals right. The other example, the person that opens up in a regional practice. So they open up a practice in Dubbo, for example, or even worse, out either, either further west hard to get available labour out there. There might be plenty of market, mm -hmm. but there's not enough staff to fill it. So that person is going to have trouble replacing the technical work. So they're going to be in, they've chosen poorly in their, in their option of where they go. Mm -hmm. Now that, so it starts with getting your fundamentals right. And what, and it goes back to where we started today's, today's session, fall in love with the market. Is there a available market for what you want to provide? Let's say you decide in a certain suburb in Melbourne is underserviced for the things you want to get and or what you want to deliver. And you know that. You know there's people saying, gee, I wish you were closer or all these other stuff. So there's, yeah. there's a market identified. Yes. And you know there's a uni up the road that's putting out student after student and they're looking for work. So you've got a chance then of marrying those two things up so you don't have to spend 10 years building your market because there's already market there. Mm. And you have to spend 10 years trying to find good team members who then will leave anyway and you'll be destitute. So if you get those two things right, I've opened practices, Angus, that I've never consulted in. What, what about the practitioner that says, uh, you know, Paul, I'm a dentist. My market is everyone with a set of teeth and everyone in this community has got a set of teeth. Or I'm a chiropractor. If you've got a spine, I can help you. Uh, you know, I'm a physiotherapist. You know, I'm, so we see everybody as our market there too. <laughs> What's the problem with that? Well, you, 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 I know where you're going with the question. They haven't, they haven't identified who their market is. Who's yeah. your niche? I mean, if I could go back in time, if I go back and have my time again, I would, I would very strongly niche my practice. It'd yes. probably be a, a knee practice or a shoulder practice or a back practice. It would be niched or a certain condition. Yeah. I, I would probably niche more firmly. It's easier to market to. It's cheaper to market to. All the reasons why we know niching is better. But you've got to make yourself an apples to oranges comparison with all of your competition. So yeah. if, you, if you find this market that is, there's a market for, I don't know, golfers or there's a market for swimmers yeah. or whoever is the, the hungry market that don't care what you charge, that you can provide an exceptional service. Yeah. The other thing that it leads to, Angus, if you're going to niche, um, be careful about requiring highly trained labor supply um, because again it comes back to our fundamentals if there's not enough available labor you can't staff it you mm. see this in pelvic practices all the time they're a heap of market but they have trouble staffing it because there's not enough pelvic practitioners around yes. and so your model your model could be wrong mm. yet that being said 
Um, there's a really good group in the US. I interviewed uh, the other lady the other day. They're doing a lot of their work online now. So they're doing all this pelvic health work delivered online. So they, and they can then employ pelvic health therapists in Texas to deliver the treatment through her practice portal. Mm. The fun, they just worked for her on a contractor basis. So she's mm-hmm. solved her available labor supply issue by changing the model. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to be a smart ass in hindsight. Oh, of, co- of course it is. But these are all the things that we, because we come into this so kind of bright eyed and bushy tailed and that I'm going to save the world and change the world. And sure, that's fine for you. Uh, but I'm different, Angus, there too. You know, there are a couple of physiotherapists in Sydney at the moment there too that are doing pre surgery assessments. Is there alternates for back surgery? Um, I, I, through different roundabouts and stuff, I know some people that are working with them. They're well into a seven figure business. Yep. And just screaming through, lovely little niche market they've set themselves up with. Before you go to surgery, come and see us. Let us assess you and see if there's something different. Yep. Not about shoulders, not about knees, not about cardiorespiratory problems there too. Back surgery, beautiful website, focused in yep. on it there too. So, and, and, and so the thing they're, gonna, they're doing too, they're not afraid to piss off the doctors. Oh, no, I bet they're not. So, so they're not afraid to mm. upset the doctors by saying, our, our, and I, I know some guys in the States doing the same thing. Our job is to prevent um, a, a million unnecessary surgeries in the USA this year. Yeah, nice. now, now, they think the doctors really enjoy it, but they don't care. They're, mark, they're not marketing to doctors. No. They don't care what the market, they, they, they're happy to piss off the doctors because they don't care. That's not their market. Mm. Their market is the person who doesn't want to have surgery. Yes. So you've identified your market and, you, and your website and your marketing, you'll know this as well as anyone, speaks to that person. Yeah. Worried, worried about your surgery. Is it necessary? Are you are you concerned that your surgeon is driving a Porsche and you've got back problem? Like you can target this any way you like, but that's yeah, what no. are these people thinking? Let's get into this. Let's just say that because I, I I could talk about this stuff all day because I, I, one I just find it fascinating. First of all, there too, but that I want to, someone's out there that says you know what Angus, um, I I, I want to get rid of the needs and I want to have more wants. You know I'll. Uh, you know, so if I can get my need to be in practice down to zero hours, and I, then I, then it's a choice game. This is it. Then it's all completely up to you, as well. Let's talk about some of the things because I've got some notes down here in front of me. I'm interested about this statement I've heard you say before: eighty percent and out the door, not a hundred percent and in the drawer. Please explain. Uh, well, you think about the fun, the fundamentals of of health professionals. What what are the things that limit us? Um, it's often perfectionism. Mm-hmm. You know, so we worry, I can't put my name to that report yeah. because because it's not 100% accurate or like, I'm yeah. not talking a report as in a medical report. I'm saying if you write a lead magnet that is, a, you know, that, that 10 exercises to fix knee pain as a lead magnet that you're going to put on the website to get leads for, the, the health profession will, will worry about that incessantly, that something's not right because they're worried that the, the 10 year physio up the road will look at it and think it's not right and they'll, and they'll feel like they're a fraud. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't do things. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I'm a fan, get it out the door. Yeah. Um, it's, who was it? Was it Reid Hoffman, uh, the guy that founded LinkedIn? Right. Uh, if, if, you're not, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. Yeah. So if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. Yeah. What he's saying is, and this is coming back to available market. Let's say you've 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 got a knee program or a or a migraine program. You want to test the market, so you don't know if there's enough market for it. So you you put on a webinar, you put on an event, if you could do an event, you you put it out there and you see how many registrations you get. And mm. if if there's people that are interested in it, you think okay, that might have some some credibility. The smart guys will then create the presentation. They won't do it until they've got an available number of people. They've, they'll, they'll do the presentation after they've done the marketing for it and they think there's a need for it. When we launched one of our initial programs, Angus, there was, a, there was the eight steps to freedom. Yes. Uh, I launched it having only one step. Okay. So, because, and it, and it went well. So, shit, I've got to prepare the other steps. So then, and each month I was, so we then, and it was a step a month. So when I got to eight months, I had the program. Yes. But, but so the, the, the people that don't get this right will do all eight things and they'll procrastinate about it and they'll muck around with it. And finally they'll launch it. And then 
heaven forbid no one wants it, you just wasted six months, 12 yeah. months. Like, just get on with it. Just put it out there. <laughs> my, um, my coach talks about more B-minus work. Start producing more B-minus work. I really love that. And the good news with that too is that if I put out B-minus work and I know what I can do as an A-plus, the people that are consuming my work don't know what my A-plus is. And so they don't look at it and go, well, this is shoddy and terrible. Although some might there too, but we want to kind of test that stuff there as well. You'd, you'd love the expression, in, in, to, the, to the blind man, the one-eyed man is king. Yes. So you're not, you're not lecturing to your lecturers. Like, like how's, my, how's this trauma? I was lecturing for the fitness industry on a, on a fitness leader course. One of my big things early was lecturing personal trainers. And I'm, I'm teaching anatomy. So I'm teaching them anatomy. Who, who's in the class? My bloody anatomy tutor from uni. So, so my anatomy tutor is there. And I think the biggest lesson I learned from that, mm. no one asks her the questions. Yeah. They asked me. I was at the front of the room. I had, I had the slides. I was the expert. That's who they were talking to. They were talking to, they didn't care about her. So don't care who else is there. Position yourself as the expert. And yeah. you can do that. Yeah. I've heard, and I use this a lot. Um, people take you at your own appraisal. Do you have got a million sayings, Angus? I'll come up with different sayings and expressions, but people take you at your own appraisal. So if someone said to me, Roddy, who's the best health business consultant coach in the world? Well, I am. Now, you can argue, I don't care if you argue or not, but in my eyes, I am. So then, then fantastic. But so people will say he must be good. He says he's good. He's doing all these lectures. He's putting himself out there. Yes. I could, I could spend another 10 years learning to be better. Mm. And maybe I would be a little bit better, but I'm not going to wait that long. I'm not going to wait for the associations to anoint me as the world's best health business expert. I'm going to anoint myself. And, <laughs> and anyway, we sometimes are worried about that because we've been technically trained and we don't want to be seen as better than anyone else or whatever else but just by being the speaker just by writing the book just by writing the report just by being on youtube you position yourself as the expert yeah there's a lot of it again you know we, we hear that 80 percent of success is turning up you know get yourself in front of the people there too one of the things that our listeners will start to realize that if they're going to move towards this practice that's less reliant on them, they're going to need to have a team around them as well. And then you have another little saying here, though, as, as well. Don't rely on anyone, e.g. admin team, you name it from there too. So how does that fit in? Because I want to extricate myself from the business. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to go in there. You've talked about that as an option there as well. And yet on this other side here, you're telling me don't rely on anyone. Where do those ideas marry together? Um, and it's a Gerberism. Um, one of the ways, one of the things you've got to do is remove discretion at the operating level of your business. So Can remove. What does that you, mean? You remove discretion at the operating level. Meaning, if you want to have a team member, a team that does really well, you've got to reduce their options. Because you, you can't, this is being terrible. Let me, let me just, I'm, I'm going to dig a big hole for myself. But the other thing you have to do is you, lev you then leverage ordinary people with great systems. Mm -hmm. Because we've talked before, if available labor is skinny, if you can't get, and, and health professionals for years have struggled finding, finding high quality team members. They can find some team members, but their quality might not be as high as they'd like, or these guys have started their own practices. So there's just not high quality. So how do you how do you how do you solve that? Well, you you create systems inside your practice that make these people better than they are. Mm. Um, one of our favourite ones, and we we do it in one minute practice a lot, is is the the report of findings, which you guys are great at. Yeah. The report of findings, and in physio world, we talk about the action plan. But but you go into a large percentage of allied health businesses, Angus, and they don't do a written plan. They they they'll say to the person, "Well, give me a call in a week, see how you're going." You know, we'll see it a few times and see what happens. Now, all that sort of rubbish conversation is is just digging a massive hole for the owner. So how do we solve that? And that's the problem when you've got people that don't back themselves. They don't book enough consults. They don't have yeah. the confidence to do that. So they under service. Yeah. So how do you solve it? Well, you get every, every team member that comes and you, you show them your report of findings. 
you go through a report of findings with them delivered well, you role play the hell out of it so that they can do it in their sleep. You then check that they're done when they start seeing their patients, you check that quality of that report of findings and you might even get them to record the report of findings. You get them to deliver it to you. You, Because in business Angus, that's a critical conversion conversation. You yes. gotta get that right. Yep. Now, if you get that right, we've just trained that person who's not maybe not a great therapist, but they can follow systems well and you train them well, they can deliver that conversation well. See, we've leveraged an possibly an ordinary person or skill level with a great system to make the patient think they're better than they are, give the patient confidence and then book in consults in advance. That's the trainable skill. Yeah. And that that comes back to the rebooking frequency. So if and, and this this training of that conversation yeah. is, is it's something I do a lot of it. And you, you get, you get a 20 year veteran to deliver your report of findings and action plan. Yeah. And it's terrible. Oh, we'll do, we'll do a bit of this. We'll do a sum of this. Uh, we'll try a few of these and we'll see how we go. Like imagine, imagine going to the brain surgeon and the brain surgeon with his scans. Oh, we'll, we'll have a, we'll do a bit of this and we'll, cut out a bit of that and then we'll have a muck around and see how it goes. No, yeah. I want you, I'm Paul, I'm going to cut through here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to specifically remove just that. And then we'll do this and this and, and you'll be fine because I've been doing this for 20 years and that's exactly what works every time. Yeah. How does that sound? When do I book in? Like yeah. it's the words you use. So because we don't train our team in that conversation, we think they're okay at it. And we look for high quality therapists who we think can already do it. Mm. We don't, we don't know if they're doing it or not. This is the list killer. They see 20 new patients a month and they empty and their books are empty. Like, yes. How's that happen? So yeah. we so it, so what I'm saying to you guys, look at those critical conversion conversations. There might be five or ten of them. What are the things in your practice where the leaks are? It, it might be that that action plan. It might be the cancellation phone call. It might be the how the admin team handle the inquiry call. And, and think about why people ring your practice. Um, are you open Saturday? Um, how much is a chiropractic consult? Think about the comment, the questions you get at front desk. Now, with poor training, as in no training, yes. the admin team wants to answer the question. How much is a chiropractic consult? $80. So the, they, and they think their job is to answer the question. They think that's the question. But regardless of what that person asks you, are you open Saturdays? Do you do shoulders? Do you have someone that does this? What's the consult price? If you train your team well, they will understand that's not the question. Mm -hmm. The question is very simply, can you help me? Mm -hmm. That's the real question. And, but we don't train our team to identify that. Therefore, the admin team answers the question because they think that's what they've got to do and it falls over. Poor training. How, how should somebody answer the question, what's the price of your consult? What have you done, Angus? Right, I've hurt my shoulder. How'd you do that? Uh, I, you know what? I was playing cricket in the backyard with my kids. Had it for long? Uh, no, I just started on the weekend. Yeah. What, what makes you want to get treatment for it now? What, why all of a sudden are you going to get something done about it? Because I can barely lift my arm above my head at the moment. And how's that making you feel? Terrible. Frustrated. <laughs> yeah, and what's the, if it doesn't get better, what's, what's going to happen as a result of that? Well, uh, at the moment, I'm having difficulty showering myself. And so uh, this is becoming a problem too. Well, we can't have the wife doing that showering stuff for you in that sort of situation. Let's check the diary, Angus. We do a thousand of those. That's exactly what we do. How's two o'clock this afternoon? That'll work just fine. Now, now, now that's just, we're just mucking around. But, yeah. but, the, but the point is that wasn't, the, the real question is not, do you fix shoulders? Or it, the real question is, you've got a problem. Can you help me? Yes. And, and the moment we identify that and we, and we act on it. Now, occasionally someone will come back and, oh, okay, and how much is that? You can mm -hmm. tell them, tell them then, but that wasn't their original question. Mm. And that, but that's, that's again, some people will say, Paul, that's, I don't know, what do they say? It's, it's, it's a sales. Paul's just done a bit of smoke and mirrors on me. He's done all this stuff. But if I fundamentally think I can help you, if you, if we delved into that and you'd tell me more about your shoulder and I think I can help you, I have a moral obligation to get you into my practice so I can. Mm. If I give you the price, 
and you and you go and ring around and get someone else who might not be as good as me or my team, I've let you down. Yes. So and 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 I, I interviewed a a clinical psychologist once about this exact area, and and I said to him as he was talking about words and the power of words, and I said to him, at at what time are you manipulating someone? I said, when, when in this are you manipulating someone? Mm. And he said, Paul, it's only manipulation if it's in your best interest and not theirs. Yes. It's only manipulation if it's in your best interest and not theirs. If I can't fix your shoulder angles, if I don't know what's going on and I'm a fraud, then then I'm manipulating you and that's, that's yeah. abysmal behaviour. But if I think I can help you and I've done a thousand of them, I see that all the time. Then, then I've got an obligation to get you in. It, it, and that's that that transposes to the treatment plan. It's the, you know, it's it, it, they get so health professionals get so caught up in money. They get mm. so caught up in the number of consults. They get so caught up in all this other stuff that they they sometimes they underservice. They and and my favourite solution to that, Angus, um, and you guys can use this. I, I get all of my guys to say, if you were my if you're my brother, Angus, uh, you'd be coming in three times a week. You'd be do we're doing this and this, and we get you back to, to tennis and basketball, no problems at all. Mm. If you were my, and if you if you pick nothing else up from today other than that, if you start every report of findings with if if you were my brother, mother, sister, father, whatever it is, yes, this is what they'd be doing. It's a very disarming. Uh, it's a very caring. And it's just telling it, and if it's true, Angus, if you're my brother, this is what we'd be doing, then my job is not to look at your finances. My job is not say, can you afford those consults? That's nothing to do with me. Yes. My job is to tell you what's going to give you the best outcome. Yeah. And that's and that's the response to that. Yeah, totally. I mean, we've talked lots about choice <laughs> in this today. You know, I think our the onus on us morally and ethically is to give the very best recommendations and just let people choose. That's it. There's nothing yeah. stressful about that. You know, and going back to that phone call as well, then morally also we, we must let the person know because they wrongly think that the best uh, tool they should use to choose a practitioner is price. And they've, they've, they've come to the conclusion that that's what it is. And we must tell them that, no, this is, when it comes to your health, shopping on price is actually not a smart thing to do. Well, well we, we've, but we've done that to ourselves, Angus, because, because we haven't differentiated ourselves in the marketplace. Mm. Yeah. If, you, if you're the only guy with the XYZ migraine program, mm. um, you, you can't be compared on price because you're the only guy that's got it. Yeah. So, so, so we haven't differentiated ourselves well enough in the eyes of the consumer. Yes. Because otherwise people are going to make a commodity decision. They'll make it, make it based on price because they think that's what it's based on. It's not. And people aren't actually price sensitive angers. They, they are value sensitive. And if you identify, if you identify this, and I, I did it to you, the significant emotional event. Mm. What's the real problem, Angus? What, what makes you want to seek treatment? Because pain is not that. Yes. People think, we analytically think that pain is the driver, but it's not. What's, what's that cause? Well, if I, if I can't, if my back doesn't get better, I can't go to work and then I'll lose income and I might lose my house. Like there, well, if I can identify that and I, I say to all of our clients, find the significant emotional event. Why is that person in your practice? And if you know that, and if our whole program is, is getting you to work so you can feed your family, that's our goal. We'll keep you at work, Angus. Don't you worry about that. We'll keep you going. You'll be able to provide for the family. We're in this together, mate. Let's get into it. Yeah. If and I'm talking pain, I've lost the point. That's not what it's about. Yeah. That's a key thing to, to know for so many reasons too, because if I want follow through, Paul, here's why I need you doing this twice a day. Remember, this is not just about your shoulder pain. When we get this sorted, this is going to mean that you're back at work and you're staying there too. Yeah. So it's important for all those kind of, uh, you know, for so many areas there too. I think... Um, because this conversation could uh, is clearly a round two and probably a round three in here for us as well. Yes. You have, um, particularly with regards to running the one, what is the one minute practice about? What does that mean? What does that term come from? You had a book that's titled that too. It, it's a lot of your branding. What is the one minute practice? 
Well, we, I identified in my business, what were the key systems that, that allowed me to distance myself from the practice? Mm. Um, and we talked about one of them. We talked about the, the report of findings or the action plan. So, so we looked at the different parts of a business and we talked about the new patient register. So one of our systems is a new, uh, in one minute practice is a new patient register, which is simply think about in your practice and following Gerber, what are the, what are the fundamental steps that have to happen in your practice on the new patient journey? So they arrive in your practice, you know, we get their details, we wanna know their referral source, uh, we want to know, did they, did they complete their uh, patient intake form correctly? Did we identify the significant emotional event? Uh, did we do a report of findings? And, and I added, and then we just think, what are the other steps? Did they get a new patient email? Did they get a new patient thank you phone call? Did the referrer get a thank you call? And I'm not talking about a doctor referral. It might be just my, my, my mother sent me in. Mm. So that's one of the steps. So you put that on a new patient register. So and we check yes or no, did each of those things happen for every new patient? Now that's, so how do you run a one minute practice? You, you set up the systems inside your business, you remove discretion at the operating level. Mm. So all I've got to do now, and I do this with my clients is we, we log into their one minute, which is now a software program. Mm. I log into their one minute practice platform. I look at the new patient register and I want to see that it's yes, 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 yes across the board for every new patient that came in, regardless of the therapist, regardless of the admin. So I've removed discretion. So why didn't, and I can, I can see from the other side of the world, what happened with Mrs. Johnson yesterday? Why didn't she get an action plan? Why is that? And so someone becomes accountable for it. There's a measurement because if, if you don't measure it, we don't know whether it happened or not. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, so one minute practice was born out of my need to have all these systems in place in one in one place I could see them all so we had a, a one minute practice profit and loss a one minute practice checklist one minute practice KPIs um, one minute practice marketing plan the one minute practice lead tracker which is for people who might have rung up or but not made a booking so instead of them being in cyberspace and and forgot it Matt we have a way to measure all this so that's, that was really where this whole one minute practice came from. And it came from me wanting to be able to log into something, a platform that I could see whether my practice was running efficiently or effectively in about a minute. Mm. And I, I do that with my clients every time I, I'll log into their platform and I'll, yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Great. Everything's on track. And yeah. I can, I can do that in a minute. That's where it came from the flight plan, I guess, to helping them have the practice they want to have. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a book, for that uh now I, i'm all the links will be in the show notes gang so in underneath this too because paul's been generous enough to kind of give me some discount codes uh whether you be a local aussie there's one code i'll have all these in the show notes for you and then if you're overseas as well um you know he's given you a fair kind of whack discount with regards to that too so thank you um don't expect it. it's not a big book what, what why would i give you a, a book called a one minute practice that takes you four hours to read like it doesn't make any sense um fundamentals how to how to run a one minute practice and i think it's 4.95 or something on but that's the just the links are under there so and use the codes whether you're in australia or over os and that'll get you started but it's yeah, a good exactly. place to start and there's some really um inside the book in the first couple of pages you can get a link that takes you to a lot of resources so you sample action plans sample marketing planners sample new patient welcome sequences that that's all in in the link in the in the first couple of pages of the book yeah, love it too. You also do um, a live training once a month as well, where you kind of demonstrate a whole bunch of this as, as well. Can you talk a little bit about, you refer to it as your kind of practiceology um, demonstration, what goes on in that and who should come along to that? Um, well, essentially what we put together is a, is a monthly presentation that demonstrates, because the practiceology is our overriding um, health business mentor program. Mm. It incorporates one minute practice, the software program, it incorporates um, online training programs and, on, and, and also a part of our group, our mentor group um, and mentoring from an experienced professional who's done all the one minute practice systems and that's called practiceology. So we do a monthly demonstration of how that works and, and effectively uh, we show you how they increase cash flow, how they decrease their, their hours uh, all in less than 90 days, even during a pandemic. And it, you know, it's how to put the systems we talked about today Mm. In, into practice and that's that's and we do a demonstration of that once a month there's a couple of time spots 
and it's always done live, Angus. We don't. There's no replay on the on the thing. I like to get personal with people, so it's a every month we do a demonstration. Yeah, and for those two, I mean, because uh, Paul, you work with chiropractors, osteopaths, podiatrists. Um, allied health from around the world so if you're not an Aussie and you're not a physiotherapist don't think that Paul doesn't you know you understand this business as well as anybody going around we're all we're all the same uh, we've got Canadian US UK it doesn't Australia physio chiropractor podiatry it doesn't actually matter mm. we all, fun, business is fundamentally the same we like to think it's different oh yeah. but but our business is different yeah but there's some nuances but gee there everything we talked about today people still buy the same way regardless of where they are in the world yeah so i want to encourage our listeners if you're interested in adding more choice back into your practice regardless of whether you want to change your hours uh, regardless of any of that kind of stuff but if you'd like to be in the driver's seat more maybe you want to spend more time with your family maybe you don't that's that's completely up to you there as well but if you want to add some more choice into it then maybe check out firstly uh, the Paul's book but secondly the training as well I'll have links for all of those uh, down in the show notes as well Paul been a pleasure chatting today uh, I'll give you the microphone final thoughts uh, guys your, your business is there to serve you like mm -hmm. that's that's really what it's about and if you think well what about but I want to help more people well you'll you'll actually help more people by training a team to deliver your great care than you will doing it yourself. So you, you actually can impact more lives by having a bigger picture. And I know you, you don't you don't lie on your deathbed wishing you'd you'd spent more time at the office. You just don't. It's very it's rare like, to hear anybody uh, say that. I, I say to it. Uh, I had a mate of mine once. We we get away with the boys get away every every year, and we always do this, and we have a great time. And my mate, who's a really high ranking uh, physician in Sydney, rings me up the day before. He said, "Righty, I can't come this year." I said, why not? Oh, I've got this list of patients. And I said, you've got to be joking. I said, what are you, I said, what are you going to remember? He said, what do you mean? I said, at, at, when we're sitting down, when we're 60, 70, 80, what are you going to remember? Are you going to remember the, the days with the boys? Or are you going to remember the patient? And he sat there and he thought, yeah, okay. And he turned up. And, and we laugh about it now because that was the boys getaway where one of the guys went over the handlebars of his quad bike into the river. So, so when we're together, we always say, how about when Wayne went over the handlebars of the river? What are you going to remember? Are you going to remember that or are you going to remember the list of clients? I'm not putting my things on you, but just make sure you know there's a cost to what you're doing. Just understand and make that decision. What are you going to remember? Beautiful thoughts. Paul, thanks for your time today. See you soon. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. See you, mate. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, you have to come and check out my Community Influencer Program. It's my monthly coaching program where we take all this material and I'll work with you to help you apply it, implement it and systemize it. The Community Influencer Group Coaching Program is designed to help you increase your practice income, impact and enjoyment. Join me over at anguspike.com forward slash join. That's anguspike.com forward slash join. I'd love to see you there.